So for the second part of chapter 10, um, where we're talking about blood dyscrasias or cellular issues with the blood, um, we're going to divide it into two parts. Um, anemias, which are the most common form of blood dyscrasia, um, and then other blood dyscrasias, so like the miscellaneous section. There are a lot of, a lot of other ones, but we're going to talk about a lot of different times anemias. So anemia causes a reduction in oxygen transport, um, and it's usually due to hemoglobin deficit, um, decrease in hemoglobin content. So if you have low hemoglobin, you have um, oxygen deficit. An oxygen deficit leads to less energy production in all cells. Cellular metabolism and cellular reproduction is diminished. Um, you have compensation mechanisms to improve the oxygen supply, which include tachycardia, increased heart rate, and peripheral vasoconstriction to keep it in the important areas of the body. So these compensation mechanisms lead to the general signs of anemia, which include fatigue, excessive tiredness, pallor, pale face, dyspnea, which is increased effort to breathe or difficulty breathing, and tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate. So um, because of the peripheral vasoconstriction, you get decreased regeneration of epithelial cells, and it causes the digestive tract to become inflamed and ulcerated, leading to stomatitis, which is, can be ulcers in the oral mucosa, inflamed cracked lips and dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, and the hair and skin might also show degenerative changes. Um, so severe anemia can lead to angina, which is chest pain, or congestive heart failure. So um, anemia has serious um, side effects. So the low hemoglobin level, it may result from a declining production of the protein or a decrease in the number of erythrocytes or a combination of these factors. So um, a lot of times anemias are classified by typical cell characteristics, um, cell morphology, or by etiology, like what's causing the anemia. So we're going to talk about the different types of anemia now. The iron, iron deficit anemia, it's insufficient iron which impairs the hemoglobin synthesis. So, you know, we need that little iron molecule to make the heme part of hemoglobin. Um, so when you have insufficient iron, it results in microcytic, which is small cells, um, hypochromic, which is less color, erythrocytes. So tiny, pale erythrocytes, if you want to think of it that way. And it results in low hemoglobin concentration in cells because you don't have that part where the oxygen um, binds to it and you just you don't have the same um, concentration in the cell. So iron deficient um, anemia is common. Um, it ranges from mild to severe and it occurs in all age groups. Um, there's an estimate that one in five women is affected and um, the proportion increases for pregnant women because pregnant women are, they're building a new human being <laughs> with their own body and cells. So yeah, it's a real strain on your body's resources. Um, but it occurs more often in women of childbearing ages because uh, women of childbearing age are bleeding on a regular basis. So they're losing red blood cells. Um, so, iron deficient anemia is frequently a sign of an underlying problem, so it's important to determine the specific cause of the deficit. Um, and you get a reduction in stored iron, um, and so it just it changes your body's um, chemistry, and so you, it's important to determine what the underlying problem is. It may not necessarily be like um, dietary deficiency. That's what I'm trying to say. So here's the iron deficient blood smear. The um, red blood cells are pale. So um, lots of different things can cause it. Uh, it can be um, the dietary intake of iron is below the minimum requirement. So um, again, 
eat your leafy greens. I figured out that steamed kale sucks, but sauteed kale is delicious. So, you know, my opinion only, of course. <laughs> so eat your kale or whatever leafy green you like. Um, dietary intake um, is really important during your adolescent growth spurt, during pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, because you, your needs increase. You're growing or you're feeding another person. So um, only about 5 to 10% of ingested iron is absorbed, but this can increase to 20% when you have an, a deficit already. Chronic blood loss from a bleeding ulcer or um, bleeding hemorrhoids or cancer can cause um, iron deficient anemia. Um, excessive menstrual flow is a common cause of iron deficient anemia as well. Um, so it just means that less iron is recycled and you do not maintain an adequate production of hemoglobin. So um, if you have impaired duodenal absorption of iron, lots of different disorders and malabsorption syndromes can um, contribute to this. And um, lack of hydrochloric acid can contribute to that. Ileitis can contribute to it. Crohn's disease. Um, Severe liver disease can affect iron absorption and iron storage because liver, it's important, it's our chemical factor of our body. Um, so a lot of times if you have a protein deficit, it further impedes hemoglobin synthesis. So um, there's uh, some in some cancers, there is a form of iron deficiency um, anemia and some infections. The iron's present, but it's not being used properly, and it leads to low hemoglobin levels and high iron storage levels. So um, cancer, and we'll talk a lot about cancer in the, um, in the fall, it can impair a lot of your body symptoms. So the signs and symptoms of um, mild anemia can be frequently in, uh, asymptomatic. As you, the hemoglobin value drops and drops, you start to see the signs and symptoms. So pallor of skin and mu mu excuse me, mucous membranes, um, fatigue, lethargy, and cold intolerance because of that peripheral um, vascular uh, contraction. Irritability, well gosh, we all have that sometimes, huh? <laughs> as long as we don't have the other stuff that goes with it. Degenerative changes such as brittle hair, um, spoon-shaped, and ridged nails. So by spoon-shaped, they mean like concave on the top instead of convex like they usually are. Um, those are degenerative changes. Um, stomatitis and glossitis, which is um, inflammation of the oral mucosa and the tongue. Um, menstrual irregularities, delayed healing, because we need that oxygen for cellular metabolism for healing. Um, tachycardia, heart palpitation, dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing, and syncope, which is fainting. As the anemia becomes more severe, these more severe symptoms come into play. So um, the way they test for uh, low hemoglobin is um, with blood, you know, blood tests and microscopic examination. The, when you look under the microscope, the erythrocytes look... Um, they don't have as much color and they're little. So that's what they see in there. And then um, it changes, your iron levels change and your hemoglobin levels change. So um, basically, in order, for treat, in order to treat it, you have to identify the underlying cause and resolve that if it's possible to resolve it. <clears throat> so the treatment and the prognosis depend on the cause. Iron-rich foods or iron supplements in the least irritating, most easily absorbable forms may be administered, but that might not be the thing that um, changes. The, it depends on what the underlying cause is. So pernicious anemia is a B12 deficiency. It's also go, called megaloblastic anemia. Um, the basic problem... Um, is lack of absorption of vitamin B12 because of lack of intrinsic factor. So intrinsic factor is secreted by the gastric mucosa and it's required for intestinal absorption of vitamin B12. So the um, megoblastic anemia 
is because the um, pernicious anemia is characterized by very large and immature nucleated erythrocytes. So unlike our mature un unnucleated erythrocytes, these guys carry less hemoglobin and they have a shorter lifespan. So our normal ones last um, about 120 days. These um, the abnormal ones don't last as long. So usually vitamin deficiencies develop gradually. Um, folic acid um, is diet related, um, a diet deficiency thing that can affect um, the development of the fetus during pregnancy. But um, with B12 deficiency, um, the uh, it's the lack of intrinsic factor that is um, decreasing the absorption of vitamin B B12. So it's not usually a dietary insufficiency is what I'm trying to say here. Um, so some people are genetically more predisposed to pernicious anemia. Um, it's more common in light-skinned women of Northern European ancestry, which is a lot of people. <laughs> and it often accompanies chronic gastritis because um, that intrinsic factors being secreted by your gastric uh, mucosa. So if you have inflammation in the gastric mucosa, it's going to affect the secretions. It can also be an outcome of gastric surgery. So um, that is just one of the... Um, so the lack of uh, B12 interferes with DNA synthesis, and so it affects the formation of those red blood cells. So this is the graphic from the book with um, development of pernicious anemia. And um, basically, the um, B12 is needed for the um, function and maintenance of neurons. And the significant deficit of the vitamin can cause symptoms in the peripheral nerves that, that may be reversible. So um, I've been working with a guy recently who has um, pernicious anemia, B12 deficiency, but he didn't see any manifestations until he lost the ability to walk. And um, so P they suspected that it might have been Guillain-Barre disease um, or a couple other things, and it took him a while to um, pare it down to pernicious anemia, and now he's been taking um, B12 injections, and he's getting his function back. So it's pretty cool. In physical therapy, we can work with people on their returning function. Um, and we get to see people get better. That is the power of physical therapy. I love it. So here's our B12 deficiency. We have these big red blood cells. And look, my gosh, they have nuclei. That's not right. They're not supposed to have those. So um, the manifestations typical of other anemias, tongue is typically enlarged, so that's our glossitis, red, sore, and shiny. Digestive discomfort, with, often with nausea and diarrhea, pins and needles, and tingling in the limbs. That's, that's specific to pernicious anemia. So they look at microscopic examination, sometimes bone marrow examination. Um, they test the B12 serum levels in the blood. And they look for presence of um, gastric atrophy. So aplastic anemia results from impairment or failure of bone marrow. It may be temporary or it may be permanent. So um, when you lose bone marrow or your bone marrow fails, you lose your stem cells, and it, re it results in pan-cytopenia. Pan meaning all, cyto meaning cells, and penia meaning less. So all of your uh, blood cells are affected. So there are decreased numbers of erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes in the blood. And these deficits lead to many serious complications. Um, bone marrow also um, has reduced cells and increased fatty tissue. So it's actually degeneration in your bone marrow, which is, you know, not good. Um, idiopathic, but it could be caused by um, myelotoxins, which like radiation, industrial chemicals, drugs um, that damage the bone marrow. And it's really important to get rid of the causative factor to allow the bone marrow to recover. Um, sometimes you get aplastic anemia due to cancer treatment, 
And they might harvest the patient's stem cells before treatment and then transfuse them later when needed. So um, viruses such as hepatitis C may cause aplastic anemia. And autoimmune diseases such as um, lupus, SLE, can affect bone marrow. Um, there can also be genetic abnormalities such as myelodysplastic syndrome or Fanconi anemia and those also affect bone marrow function. So um, lots of different things can cause it, but really at its core, it's failure of bone marrow. So with aplastic anemia, um, the signs and symptoms are the same signs of anemia, pallor, weakness, dyspnea, um, leukopenia, um, thrombocytopenia, and erythrocytopenia. So, um, sometimes, though, you get the um, leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, and the erythrocytes appear normal. So um, it's uh, a lot of times they do a bone marrow biopsy to figure out what the heck's going on. If you can identify the cause and treat it promptly, so get it, get, you know, they're being exposed to benzene, you get them away from the benzene, um, remove those bone marrow suppressants, and if you... Failure to, if you fail to identify the cause and treat effectively, can be life-threatening. So they use blood counts to look for this. Um, sometimes people need bone marrow transplantation. Hemolytic anemia results from excessive destruction of red blood cells. So lots of different causes of hemolytic anemia could be genetic defects, immune reactions, changes in blood chemistry, infections such as malaria. Um, toxins in the blood, antigen antibody reactions such as incompatible blood transfusion, or um, erythroblastosis fetalis, and that's where the mother and the fetus have the incompatible Rh factors. So sickle cell anemia is a genetic condition. It's um, an autosomal. It's considered an incomplete dominant, meaning you don't always get it if you are heterozygous for um, the gene. Anemia occurs when you are homozygous recessive, though. Um, diagnostic testing is available. It's more common in individuals of African ancestry. Um, heterozygous condition is somewhat protective against malaria, which is interesting since malaria originated in Africa. One in ten African Americans is heterozygous for the trait, meaning if you have two parents that are heterozygous with the trait, for the trait, you, it's possible for you to have a homozygous recessive child. So here's our um, here's our genetic chart. We saw some of these in the genetics chapter. Um, so if you have a normal um, parent and a carrier parent, 50% um, um, for the 50% chance for a child to have the sickle cell trait. Um, if you have a parent that has sickle cell. 25% um, normal, 25% with sickle cell, 50% with the trait, meaning they're um, heterozygous and not explaining the trait. Um, if you have a parent, both parents with sickle cell anemia, you are 100% that the kids will have it. So um, it causes abnormal hemoglobin. A sickle cell crisis occurs whenever oxygen levels are lowered. So altered hemoglobin is unstable and changes shape in the case of hypoxemia. And the sickle-shaped cells are too large to pass through the microcirculation. And obstruction leads to multiple infarctions in areas of necrosis. So a sickle cell crisis can be life-threatening. So here's our um, normal cell in picture B and our abnormal cell in C. So B can just slide right through those capillaries and C has a much harder time. And you can see the way it's shaped, that's why they call it sickle cell. Okay, um, you can have multiple infarctions affecting brains, bones, and organs. And in addition to the basic anemia, you can also have hyperbilirubinemia, um, jaundice, and gallstones. And those are caused by a high rate of hemolysis. Um, clinical signs don't usually appear until a child's about 12 months old. So, severe pain because of ischemia of tissues and infarction, pallor, weakness, tachycardia, and dyspnea, those normal anemia signs, 
hyperbilirubinemia, which causes jaundice, um, splenomegaly, which is the in, um, enlarged spleen because you're processing all these um, cells that uh, are a result of hemolysis, um, vascular occlusions and infarctions in the lungs leading to acute chest syndrome, and smaller blood vessels leading to hand-foot syndrome. Um, it can delay growth and development, and it can lead to congestive heart failure. So they test it with blood tests, hem uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis, and you can do prenatal DNA analysis. Um, it's treated. Um, hydroxyurea has reduced the frequency of crisis, which is great. Dietary supplementation with folic acid, bone marrow transplantation, and um, immunization in children so they don't get into those hypoxic states. So um, these are the different types of anemias, chart from the book. I like these charts because they just boil things down into a nice little package.